Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, on the second day of our annual conference, virtual conference this year between the National Network of Parent Care Forums and Contact. I'm Gail Walsh, I'm Director of Participation and Development at Contact, and I'm joined today by Kath. Kath Hi, Johnson. my name is Kath Bromfield, and I'm Northwest Steering Group member for the National Network of Parent Care Forums. And Kath and I are here today just to host uh, a short presentation uh, video from the uh, uh, from Justin Tomlinson, who is Secretary of State at the Department for Work and Pension, who has pre-recorded a session for us for us to listen to. Uh, so just to explain, this isn't going to be an interactive session; it's pre-recorded. So we'll play the video from Justin for you shortly. We won't be able to ask answer any questions today. So they're directed be, be directed the Department for Work and Pensions, but the NNPCF and Contact will endeavour to get any um, questions followed up and answered, and we can always try and share those answers to you later. So I think that's everything for now. I think we'll go straight into the presentation from Justin. Okay, if we can play the video, thanks. Thank you for inviting me to speak today and be part of this week of important discussion and learning about the vital contribution that parent carers can make. I have seen firsthand, both in my role as the Minister and in the work I do in my constituency, just how important it is for disabled children and young people to have access to the best support. This undoubtedly helps them through not only their early years, but to go on to lead a full life and realise their ambitions. This government is absolutely committed to supporting everyone to achieve their full potential and to live independent and fulfilling lives. Integral to this vision is ensuring that people with the greatest needs are supported the most. Whether that's through the welfare safety net, which rightly supports people, their carers and families who often face enormous day-to-day -day challenges, or through our manifesto commitment to develop a cross-government national strategy for disabled people. For people with long-term health conditions and disabilities, there can be additional costs of living. That's where extra costs benefits like disability living allowance, and personal independence payments can help. These non-means tested benefits are designed to alleviate some of the additional financial needs faced by people with disabilities and health conditions. For PIP, the amount that someone receives depends on their daily living and mobility needs arising from their health condition or disability rather than the health condition or disability itself. This means that whether the condition affects your mental or physical health or both, the assessment takes a much wider look at how someone is impacted on a daily basis. Both PIP and DLA passport families to additional support including child disability premiums paid within income related benefits, carers allowance, the motability vehicle scheme and the blue badge scheme. I'm pleased to say that we have spent over £54 billion this year alone on benefits to support disabled people and people with health conditions, up nearly £10 billion since 2010 and more than ever before. Spending on PIP, DLA and attendance allowance will be nearly £3 billion higher in real terms than it was 10 years ago. We also recognise the valuable role that carers play in looking after loved ones, now more than ever. Carer's allowance was increased this year, meaning an additional £694 a year since 2010. We also brought in special measures through the pandemic so that carers can continue to get support even if they have to temporarily stop caring or change the way they do so because of Covid. We have also increased the rate of DLA by over £130 a month since 2010 and are spending more than ever on DLA for disabled children. Finally, we've increased the enhanced rates of PIP up by over £880 a year since its introduction in 2013. Now let me turn to the unprecedented and rapidly evolving circumstances this year due to COVID-19. The government was quick to recognise the risks posed to disabled people and acted decisively, implementing changes at pace to keep everyone safe while continuing to pay benefits on time. This included rapidly establishing a telephone assessment service automatically extending some PIP and DLA awards to ensure people continued to receive financial support. We also relaxed the rules around breaks in care and introduced an easement to allow emotional care to count for carers allowance to support carers whose pattern of care had to change as a result of the pandemic. We have now extended these easements until May 2021. Our staff have worked tirelessly this year to continue to process new claims and changes of circumstance to make sure that families were getting the level of support they are entitled to. 
I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to charities and other organisations in our local communities up and down the country who have also stepped up to support those most in need. Now I want to turn to our record on disability employment. An important part of living independently is where possible and suitable finding and staying in work and in particular for young disabled people supporting them in finding work. We know that disabled people tend to find it more difficult to get jobs when out of work, which is why we are actively working on our policies to prevent ill health related job losses and we provide specific employment support for disabled people out of work. We are proud to have delivered disability employment of 4.3 million, up 1.4 million since 2013. Despite the unprecedented challenge of COVID-19, we remain every bit as ambitious with our goal of 1 million more disabled people in work over the decade to 2027. We are helping disabled people stay in work and enter work through a range of programmes, including Access to Work, which is helping record numbers of young disabled people, and Disability Confident, the Work and Health programme, and the Intensive Personalised Employment Support programme. Our providers have continued to be there to support people throughout the COVID-19 period and have adapted the service they offer to provide excellent support to participants over the phone and digitally. We launched the Work and Health Programme's Job Entry Target and Support Scheme, also known as JETS in October, in response to COVID-19, which provides early, light touch support to help young people with disabilities and health conditions focus their job search on the current labour market after 13 weeks of unemployment. Disabled unemployed people will also benefit from the additional investment in the plan for jobs. We are recruiting thousands of additional work coaches who provide personalised support. Our funding providers to offer a range of help through JETS, including specialist advice on how people can move into growing sectors, as well as CV and interview coaching. In addition to financial and employment support, we have made changes to how we work to best serve the needs of disabled people, improving visibility of access to work for a variety of audiences. The scheme is tailored to an individual's needs and can fund flexible, personalised support of up to £60,700 per person per year. We support pre-employment activities including work experience, apprenticeships and Department of Education supported inter internships and traineeships. Through Kickstart Scheme we have provided funding for employers to create job placements for 16 to 24 year olds on universal credit. Kickstart participants can apply for access to work and we are working with employers to help them become disability confident. This goes to supporting young people undertaking a job placement and can help with the transition between university and work to ensure continuing support when disabled students allowance comes to an end. DWP works closely with other government departments to develop new approaches to help young disabled people with learning disabilities and autism and I would like to thank you for your support in this work. We are continuing to develop new approaches to working with adult social care and with further education providers, for example through supported internships. In addition to what we have already done, we are continuing to work on our Green Paper and National Strategy for Disabled People. Both programmes will be extensively consulted on in the coming months and shaped by disabled people, disability forums and disability stakeholders to make sure that we are putting real lived experience at the very heart of our plans. With the Green Paper, we want to build a system that puts people trust and to do so, we will consider how we improve our current services so they are better and easier to use, such as understanding the opportunities created by telephone and video assessments, exploring how we offer extra support to help people access and navigate our services, such as advocate support. The National Strategy for Disabled People also provides a cross-government commitment to remove barriers to ensure disabled people can lead a life of opportunity and fully participate in British society. This highly ambitious strategy takes a cross-government approach, focusing on the issues that disabled people say affect them the most in all aspects and places of life, including housing, education and transport. All departments are contributing to the goal of removing barriers and making this country more inclusive for disabled people. Its significance is even greater as we rebuild the UK's economy and society in response to COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much. So 
pre-recorded session there from Justin Tomlinson, uh, which obviously we're grateful for the Department for Work and Pensions for providing for us. There's been a few questions in the um, questions boxes that come through to Kath and I, and we'll collate those and make sure that they get sent to the Department for Work and Pensions, and we'll see whether we can get some responses. Thought it would be helpful to share some information about where you may want to uh, seek additional support around benefits and resources from Contact. Uh, many of you may already be aware that uh, Contact have a helpline and online support around benefits and money resources. And we can share these slides so that you can get the links to all of our support offer there. Uh, our team are very experienced in being able to provide information around PIP. Um, DLA, etc., which you heard information about in that uh, that presentation there from Justin. There's also some information at contact around uh, our social care resources. And the next slide, please. Here we go. So we've also I've just got here the information on our support offer. So if you want to find the pages on our website our telephone helpline and our listening ear. So if you do want to speak or have any questions that perhaps have come up out of the session today that you want to try and get answered, uh, you could try through our team there. Uh, we've also got some pages on, just moving to the next slide, uh, some education resources as well. So there's some fact sheets and information on our web pages around education support. Obviously it's important uh, to be thinking about employment during education too. So there wasn't a huge amount of information uh, that we have on this session other than that. Kath, are you still with me? Um, okay. Yeah, we had a workshop earlier and we just wanted to share because it feels like it goes in, in sync with this with um, Hugh from BASE around supported employment. And um, we have got some feedback, I think, that will be helpful to forums. So if you're interested in receiving anything around this topic, do fill that in with the survey at the end. But Hugh was talking about some of the soft skills forums and parent carers can give to their young people as they start looking towards supported employment. And um, mentioned that, you know, we can, we can stress as well that we need to have um, employment in EHCPs earlier. So we need to start making sure we hold people to account for those things. And also to make sure our local offer has it relevantly mentioned and to question. So Gail and I just felt from the workshop earlier, they were a couple of things that added to the minister's um, speech then. So I hope you find that useful. And if you want more information, do put that in the evaluation. Okay. Appreciate it. It was quite a short session this afternoon. Uh, thank you ever so much for joining us. Helen, I think if you can just come through to the last slide for me. And um, as I say, we'll take the questions away from this and feel free that you can send those questions to contact or the NMPCF separately if you haven't had a chance to do so in this short session today. Kath, anything else from you today? Just to thank everyone for coming and, and it was brief but to the point and uh, we look forward to your comments on that. Okay, thanks everybody and thank you Helen.